there was an exhibition a few years ago here in New York of a painting by the Italian painter Umberto Boccioni. And uh, Boccioni made uh, a painting in 1903, which appeared in that show, called Roman Landscape. And um, this was uh, a painting made before he hitched his wagon to the, uh, to the futurists. Um, this painting shows a cow grazing in a field, a very dense field of sparky greens um, uh, filled with grass and wildflowers. And um, high in the right-hand corner of this painting, however, almost isolated, almost in exile from the sheared all over textures of the paint of the field is a cow. And it's affixed to that that wiry surface like boilerplate, alien to the presentation of the scene. Almost as if Boccioni were pressing a kind of Italian emblem to, uh, onto a French technique to nationalize it, perhaps. But also to rehearse what had been a crucial, indeed critical moment in the history of 19th century Italian painting. Because that cow with its very even textures and the way it inflected the light is very clearly a macchiaioli cow. For decades, oxen and cows had been a, a prevalent motif for a group of these painters in Tuscany called the macchiaioli for reasons uh, I'll explain in a minute. And no Italian painter at the turn of the century could pretend to ignore their existence. Although I don't have a, a slide of this Boccioni painting, uh, our first slide will show you a, uh, a macchiaiolo cow. This is a painting by a, by a painter named uh, Abati. This uh, scene um, uh, on that area of Tuscany called the, called the Maremma, a sort of uh, marshy area southwest of Florence, was a very popular painting spot for the uh, Macchiaioli, much as the, uh, the forest of Fontainebleau was a favorite spot for the Barbizon painters. <clears throat> well, at any rate, uh, there was really no Italian painter at the turn of the century who could ignore the existence of these, um, these painters. Though in the making of modernist art, the influence of the Macchiaioli wouldn't nearly be as decisive as um, the influence of the Impressionists. By the end of the century, that technique, which was called la macchia, first developed in the late 1850s, uh, 1850s, had long been the most familiar manner in Italian realist painting. And in 1903, when Boccioni made his painting, that cow of his commemorated a stream of European painting, which, however slight, its influence in shaping the major idioms of 20th century art did indeed produce some exceptional painters, three of whom I'm going to uh, discuss this evening, and did indeed help to create at least a matrix out of which modernist idioms would emerge. Any discussion of these painters has to begin with a discussion of the name and the origins of, uh, of the name. The, the word macchia in Italian means a, a spot. Or a, or a blotch, you can speak of a, a, una macchia d'inchiostro, an ink, an ink blotch or an ink blot. Um, and, um, and it can also refer to a, a, a smear. Um, technically, in, the tech, in painting technique, a macchia is, is also what they call um, the name given to a quickly executed color sketch. Uh, the verb macchiare means technically to apply color through direct observation of a subject. Uh, Vasari, centuries ago, used this term to describe works by uh, Giorgione and by the aged uh, Titian, both of whom uh, drew with color directly on the canvas. The macchia, therefore, as a technique, conveys immediacy, spontaneity, a kind of on-the-spot transcription. And the essence of macchia effect, as the macchiaioli uh, painters uh, felt it is uh, a kind of flashing expression of sensation, boldly and simply with color stains. Um, 
for the original macchiaioli, perfecting their technique during the movement's peak years in the uh, 1850s and early 1860s. The macchia also served as a kind of uh, structural instrument, a critical way of probing in a new way the action of light on motifs. One of the painters I'll talk about tonight, Telemaco Signorini, an acquaintance, um, a friend indeed of Degas, uh, writing in 1874, long after he had repudiated the macchia, uh, as a number of very good macchia painters eventually did, uh, Signorini described it in its beginnings as nothing more than an exaggerated, violent chiaroscuro, and that for him and for other young painters, it was exciting in the 1850s because it replaced the thinned out, feeble chiaroscuro of academic painting and replaced it with a robust, frontal, and emotionally responsive colorism. Uh, it's worth mentioning that um, Signorini, like the two other important uh, macchiaioli I'll discuss tonight, namely Giovanni Fattori and Silvestro Lega, they were trained by the academies and were in part um, in practicing the macchia technique as they did, they were going against some of the trends in the academy of the time. Um, the macchiaioli adapted, however, to their own purpose. The preparatory sketching, uh, which they call alla mezza macchia, which they had learned uh, in the academies, which um, was a way of using flattened, aggressive contrasts and bulky solidities of color they worked up this exercise into a kind of master style, especially suited to the plain air painting they favored. As a technique, however, that is to say, and this is my understanding of technique, that technique is, is a process of representing a felt vision of reality, that as a technique, the macchia could interrogate light and matter in a more dynamic way than was available to them in the example of Barbizon painting, for example which all of them admired. The landscape that they favored was this one, the Maremma, the coastal plains and scrubland south of, southwest of Florence. Uh, this area also, because it was scrubland and relatively deserted, was also a favored refuge for outlaws. Um, one word for that kind of wooded area is macchia. The phrase, the idiom, fare alla macchia, means to hide out in the woods. And alla macchia, to do anything alla macchia, means to do it in a kind of shady, underhanded, deceitful, or um, clandestine way. The Tuscan word for outlaw, um, uh, a dialect term, I guess, is, um, uh, is macchiaiolo, spelled with, a, spelled with a J in the middle there, macchiaiolo. Uh, so that when a sardonic reviewer in 1865 characterized the uh, technique of some of the new painters who exhibited at Italy's 1861 National Exposition and described them as macchiaioli, spelled with a J. That term fused this new technique of, of uh, painting to social mischief, to interference, and to disruptiveness. The title, therefore, took on, as we might expect, a kind of political suggestiveness. Since in the late 1850s, Italy had also entered uh, a very momentous political period called the Risorgimento, uh, which were the rebellions, the wars of liberation, and geographical redefinitions that culminated in unification and freedom from Austrian occupation in the 1860s and early 1870s. The Macchia, therefore, developed at the same time as these patriotic um, feelings of unification developed. And the Macchia emerged as a kind of national or, if you will, nationalist style. The coincidence of the new painting and political change was so intense that one historian of the movement, uh, Dario Durbe, insists that uh, political engagement for the Macchiaioli was, in his terms, a matter of primary, almost existential importance for the Macchiaioli. I, I've just been reading a book by um, um, by Albert uh, 
Boime, I think his last name is pronounced, um, who has written articles previously about the Machia. And his entire book has to do with the connections between these painters, the way they painted, and the kinds of political changes, uh, momentous political changes that were taking place in Italy at the time. Uh, I am not qualified to judge uh, the truth of these kinds of assertions. Uh, but I think I can say that the Risorgimento sentiments that we can find flaring in a fair amount of Machia painting, uh, and not only in the actual battle scenes which some of these painters um, uh, depicted, that what we do see is a natural volatility of style of the Machia itself, which serves as a supple technique for expressing doubt, exuberance, rage, the discouragement and the sullenness felt by artists during those difficult times. It must also be said that the Machiaioli are still, in fact, this is one of the cliches, I think, of, of, um, of uh, 19th century Italian art history, that the Machiaioli are sometimes still referred to as Italian Impressionists, and I think it's important to, to put that as well in context and correct it. Um, the, because Machiaiolismo and uh, Impressionism remained rather separate enterprises, um, <clears throat> though they shared certain ambitions. Machiaioli painting developed really as a form of realism in a more scrupulous and less adventurous way than the impressionistic realism we find perhaps in uh, Manet or Degas. But at the same time, it investigated volume and color in ways which place it squarely in the formal agitations of 19th century representation. Some of the coincidences between Machiaioli painting and Impressionism are, are rather startling. Uh, for instance, Monet once commented, he had read Ruskin's, uh, John Ruskin's books, book, Elements of Drawing, that came out in, uh, in 1857, and Monet said that that book contained uh, most of the theory of Impressionist painting, I, uh, an idea which probably would have surprised Ruskin. Um, and, uh, but Monet said that it, it did so because of its emphasis on the need to paint what the eye actually sees, the reality which presents itself to your eyes, in Ruskin's words, only as an arrangement of patches of different colors variously shaded. Well, that in fact describes the Machiaioli method of representing objects in macchie of color. They were in their own way, the Machiaioli, seeking to recover what Ruskin himself called the innocence of the eye, painting out of a sort of childlike perception, as uh, Ruskin puts it, of these flat stains of, of color, which were the compositional elements of the world. The macchia was a means of copying that nature. Its emphasis, however, was on technique, on the manner of applying paint. The macchiaioli were not concerned, as the Impressionists were, with the intense subjectivity of perception. They were more caught up in painting as a recovery of the real, not a remaking of it. And this puts them, I think, on the other side of the mirror that stands as a kind of passage to modernist painting. The Machia is important to our understanding of modern representation because of the way it preserves in the finished work the look of the plein air sketch, sharp contrasts and highlighting, fat light, patchy swabbed brushwork. These are the effects the Machiaioli heightened in the studio, giving the provisional and the indeterminate a rather finished look. It was very obviously an act of copying, of getting down the appearances of nature in a particular way. Machia technique, however, stopped short of fusing itself to the whole scenic matrix of the subject, as the plein air painting of Monet and Pissarro did. For a painter like Giovanni Fattori, um, the technique of copying nature was an act of witness more than it was a drama of sensation. With that assumption, he could not pursue the project that Clement Greenberg attributes to Impressionism, for instance, that of, in, Green's, in Greenberg's terms, pushing the faithful representation of nature so far that representational painting is turned inside out. But in pushing painting, toward an irreducibility of technique. The Machiaioli contributed at least to the pressures being exerted on uh, representation. These painters did not consider their panel 
They're small panel and cardboard sketches, finished works. They entered in exhibitions only canvases completed in their studios. Today, however, uh, the sketches are among their most compelling works because we experience them, I believe, as genetic material in the evolution of modern representation, in particular the way they confer on momentary vision the value of the permanent and the realized. For me, the most exquisite of Machiaioli paintings is a painting by Fattori uh, called the Rotonda di Palmieri, which you can find if you, next time you visit um, Florence and you go to the Palazzo Pitti, if you go up to the third floor, the modern art gallery, that's where one of the great collections of Macchiaiolo art uh, is to be found. And this little painting by Fattori is there, and we can look at it uh, now. This is very small. This is uh, roughly four, by, four inches by 18. It's an oil sketch on wood that shows seven women in their long skirts and shawls under an awning by the sea. The depth of this painting is collapsed into a stack of high contrast colors banded across the surface. The yellowish canopy with a serrated edge is laid on that strip of sky. And under that, a sloping purplish uh, promontory, blue water, muted sunlight, skirting a roseate olive green ground. The figures are deployed at vertical levels, almost as if they're on risers. The faces visible to us are color blanks. Those of you who saw uh, the Martin Scorsese picture, The Age of Innocence, may remember that in, in two scenes in that picture, when the, um, the Daniel Day-Lewis character, Leland Archer, I think, is, I, I think the character's name is, uh, behind him, uh, appear two Machiaioli paintings. One is very similar to this. It's uh, with figures with blanks as faces. And another, as I recall, is a very uh, wide and narrow marine painting. The effect of this one is geological. We see anonymous fossilized human shapes fixed in a kind of mineral strata. The sketchiness of it mysteriously intensifies the stillness of the scene. Now, it needs to be said that the Machiaioli, many of them produced uh, paintings like this rather often because they sketched so, so, uh, so frequently and with such enthusiasm. And I think it would have surprised Fattori, um, perhaps um, angered him, to find that it's this kind of painting that perhaps speaks most directly and immediately to us today. Although they were trained primarily as plein air painters, the Machiaioli ranged far and wide in their subjects. They felt the excitement and pressures, certainly of the new medium of photography. Um, the first famous Italian photographers, the Alinari brothers, uh, opened their first studio in Florence in 1854, for instance. Um, and these uh, Machiaioli applied the Macchia to the task, therefore, of recording the textures of contemporary Italian life, trying to make this technique responsive to mm, the new facts, the, f the new facts of, of modernism, of modern life. They had the old and the new right there before them. Florence in the 1850s and 1860s was a commercial and a political center. For a period of time, it was the capital of Italy. Its suburbs were being developed and industrialized, but at the same time, its countryside was host to ancient pe peasant cultures and also to middle-class villas, usually to be found side by side. The responses of the Machiaioli, particularly of the three that I'm going to talk about tonight, were so distinct that even to speak of the Machiaioli sometimes feels like a mere historical convenience. We may identify them as a solidarity, as they indeed often identify themselves, often for political purposes, but they nevertheless differed one from another as much as did Monet Pissarro and Sisley. And each of the three uh, uh, important painters around the mid-1860s curiously began to paint in ways which, while less boldly asserting the macchia as a signature technique, absorbed macchia effects into the more expansive and acquisitive ambitions of realism. Could we look at the next one? <clears throat> 
This is a, a painting by a, a painter named Abati called Cloister, painted in 1861, an oil sketch done on cardboard. And this too can be found in the Pitti. And this too, like that uh, Fattori uh, picture we just looked at, is a, is a miniaturist masterpiece. It's about seven by 10 inches. We see blocks of white and olive black stone lying there in the sun. The paint itself, if you see this thing, the paint seems to possess the weight and density of the light laden stone, which was uh, Abati's motif. It seems indeed to sweat of its own material, uh, materiality. For all his uh, dazzling technique, however, Abati was entirely defined by Machia technique. Um, he was a kind of painter who couldn't mm, adapt it to other uses or paint his way out of it. Uh, Signorini, however, was, um, was capable of doing so. He wanted, in fact, Signorini did, something more than just Machia technique. In his own attempts to make himself into a realist, able to accommodate new visual facts, he made his own impatience with Machia technique a vital quality of it. It was, <clears throat> well, maybe I should say something about his, about Signorini's subjects. Um, the kinds of subjects that he pursued in making himself into a, a realist painter were rural labor, marketplaces, city streets, also institutions. Uh, and the Machia's pasty indefiniteness enabled him to paint mm, modern instances, so to speak, in such a way that the subject often seems to be coming into existence there on the ever more flattened picture plane. And this too, I think, recommends him uh, to us. Uh, there are the most interesting coincidence for me, historical coincidence in Signorini's career, is the coincidence with mm, Degas. Passing through Florence in 1875, where he had relatives and was in fact to work on his famous painting of the, the Bellelli family, which was included in that great Degas exhibition of a few years ago at the Metropolitan. When Degas was uh, traveling uh, through Florence, he stopped to visit Signorini's studio and uh, saw when he was there um, a painting called The Ward of Mad Women at uh, San Bonifacio. And unfortunately, this is a painting which we were not able to get. Um, it's, a, it, it's a very large painting and it has uh, this tall, vaulted spaces um, with a broken arrangement of figures, a dozen or so women, all of them in grubby gowns, most of them sitting on a long bench against a wall. Each of the figures in Signorini's paintings, in this particular painting, and I think this is what recommended it particularly to Degas' attention, each of these women seems uh, an, an invincible uh, solitude. This is a social group of sorts, this group of mad women, where there is no evident relation among its neighbors except a shared general um, devastation. If you call to mind Degas' figure groups, such as the Bellelli family, or later scenes in business offices and milliner shops, um, I think you'll remember the kind of extraordinary self-containment uh, or separateness of individual figures participating, however, in the same society. The isolation of the women, of the, women the mad women in Signorini's picture, however, is both a symptom and intensifier of derangement. Each pose in the Signorini picture, in fact, is an articulation of disorder. There's one woman lying on the floor. Um, uh, there's another uh, clutching a table leg. Another uh, sits twisting her head in her hand like a, like, a, like a mortar and pestle. One shakes a fist at a vision only she can see. Another stands very queenly in the middle of the floor, isolated like the rest of them. In subsequent years, Signorini explored a variety of contemporary subjects. And uh, the dissonant tonalities of urban life in particular attracted him. Um, and he met them with a technical audacity, which I think his, his experience as a macchiaiolo uh, had prepared for him. 
during a trip to Scotland, he did a number of, of paintings, uh, the most famous of which is called uh, uh, Lythe, which we do have here. This is, is in fact the best known of the paintings that he uh, produced during a trip to England uh, and Scotland in 1880, 1881. He contracts perspective in this in such a way that the people on the street, the, uh, the window shoppers, the policemen, the woman pushing the pram there with the child, are all spread out beneath the blazon of that, that Rob Roy whiskey advertisement painted on the wall. Social relations are being lived out beneath that great sign with its recollection of the Scottish hero and Sir Walter Scott's then rather recent retelling of that story. The language of commerce in this painting, as, as Signorini uh, relates it to us, is a, is a new and watchful deity and a rather volcanic deity it is. The signs checkered red leathers have a, uh, an almost day glow intensity in the painting. And I don't know any other painting of the time that filled so much canvas space with the kind of aggressive commercial um, uh, message that several decades later would become both the subject and the method of a great deal of pop art in America. Um, in 1894, Signorini returned to the subject of imprisonment um, which he had treated earlier in that painting of the mad women that I described uh, moments ago. And he returned to it in a painting called The Prison at Porto Ferraio, and we have that one too. Uh, a superb uh, commentator on uh, the Macchiaioli and has written really the book on, uh, on, on these painters, uh, Norma uh, Broad, uh, proposes this, I think, rightly, as a companion piece to that asylum picture I mentioned. More than anything that uh, Signorini did, uh, this picture approaches the, I think, the florid depthlessness of early modernist painting. In this one, there are two, we see the two files of prisoners receding from the foreplane toward the rear of that long corridor. Centered between them are two officials in their dark suits, and behind them, two guards dressed in blue-white uniforms and uh, pith helmets. The prisoners' figures shrink away into patchy faces and patchy physiognomies, physiognomies a la macchia. Their flesh seems to melt inside those sketchy uh, clothes. Each one is distinct, however, and yet all remain irresolute in the slouching drawing and the streaked macchia striping of their outfits. The two guards in the back there are almost like lanterns that shed only a very small pool of light over those dark clad officials. Signorini blocks out this scene, I feel, in a way that might lead to a kind of sentimental irony or even an ideological scheme. But he does not allow content to determine style. The macchiaioli were given, it must be said, to sometimes rather gluey uh, pathos, or style to reduce content to a mannered pattern. What he does do in this painting, I feel, is to present degradation, authority, the uniformities common to the different stations or degrees of freedom, because he is painting through documentary contents to find an emotional uh, truth, an emotional verity, that the documentary contents are not um, the end. Another interesting painter, an important painter, is uh, Silvestro Lega. And he too, as a young artist, um, studied in the academy, studied with a painter named Luigi Massini, who liked to look back to the example of the Nazarene painters, those German painters active uh, in Italy several decades earlier, uh, who worked a kind of primitive treatment of Christian subjects and look back to the uh, Quattrocento, the Florentine Quattrocento. And Lega was a textbook instance, I think, of an artist skilled in the treatment of biblical and classical themes who in the charged political and artistic climate of the late 1850s, that Machiaioli uh, climate, had a kind of conversion experience to Machia realism. As Signorini 
was beginning to apply the Machia to a realism of denser contents, Lega was saying this, that a work is not, which is not done from nature cannot be good. Lega's best work, in fact, took as its subjects, however, the domestic arrangements of women, especially in the serene country village, villas of the commercial middle class, whose economic and social stability was being affected by the general unrest during the Risorgimento. During the 1860s, for instance, Lega was a frequent guest at an estate at a place called Piagentina in the Tuscan countryside. This was a haven, in fact, for the, a, a number of Macchiaioli painters um, more or less hung out at this, uh, at this villa. And uh, in the ritualized household activities of life at Piagentina, um, we see we see these instances memorialized in Lega's paintings, but what we don't see is the formal restlessness that's so evident, I think, in this and other paintings by Lega's contemporary uh, Signorini. Uh, the kinds of subjects that Lega favored were mm, that of a trio of women making music at a piano by an open window, or a, a trio of visitors greeted by a friend outside a villa, a slide which we'll get to much later, I think. Uh, a betrothed couple strolling through fields. We have pictures by Lega of women sewing or giving lessons, posing for painters, middle class women, serving women, peasant women. These were all his subjects during the 1860s and early 1870s. And they have an obvious historical value in documenting social relations, which photography itself had already begun to record. What makes Lega's Piagentina work so interesting, I think, is his use of the macchia in deploying color planes and figures suggestive of social arrangements, but not polemically um, determinant of social arrangements. His most famous painting is uh, this next one. This is called the Pergola. Um, and it's in, the, it's in the Brera in Milano. Done in 1866, we see a serving, gear, a serving girl bringing coffee in the late afternoon. The original title of this painting was Dopo Pranzo, after, after lunch. Uh, it's a country setting, and half the canvas space is occupied with the background there, the tall grass, arable fields, cypresses, as if to establish the picture's uh, plain arist uh, pedigree. As in his other figure groups, the critical relations in this painting are worked out in the refinements of chiaroscuro. Um, the three women of the villa household are clustered inside the recess of the, the arbor there on the left side of the canvas. To the right, across the vertical divider made by one of the arbor poles, the serving girl approaches. They are seated in shade. She is walking the lowering sun at her back. Their shadows are confused with the larval shadows of the trellis work. Her shadow spears across the ground, running nearly the entire width of the picture. My description risks making this painting sound a little overdetermined, um, and it does indeed have a, a clear pictorial scheme, but not used for a polemical purpose or as an exercise in social criticism. Lega was not interested in analyzing the social hierarchy or petty bourgeois habits of his very generous uh, hosts. Nor are his pictures, as some writers have uh, said, idealizations of villa life, of gentry culture, then on the wane, then th indeed being threatened by recent political events. Though Lega's generally sedate treatment of the subject in the pergola at first gives it the appearance of a precious, harmonious moment preserved. In the hands of a great realist like Courbet, whose work, um, at least in these days, was still not very well known in Italy. In the work of someone like Courbet, paint was handled in such a way that it bore a sense of the instability, um, the instability of the, the very concrete world whose material fastness the painter sought to represent. A painting's materiality for Courbet, I think, was itself bound up in its aspiration to copy the look and feel of matter. For nearly a century thereafter, the effort to represent a simple fact of nature itself was to become a primary subject. 
Lega, however, particularly in this painting, was no interrogator, no such interrogator of material reality like Courbet. In the pergola, however, he does avoid the predetermined and therefore sentimentalized emotion dictated by the social paradigm, as it were, which the scene depicts. The picture, I feel, is charged with a fragile and rather remote melancholy that makes it not so much an image of social exclusions, but rather one of self-containments and privacies. The melancholy itself is ritualized. The idleness of that young woman, of the young women, excuse me, looks very much like uh, torpor to my eyes. The child in the group looks as listless uh, as they, as if it were a legacy, just as much resigned to a life of waiting, waiting for the serving girl, who is not really so much set in opposition to them, but she is zoned apart in a concentration or a resolve not visible in the figures of the others. Though even this seems a bit wearied by habit. She dominates the composition in a sly way, though her figure is drawn no more prominently and her isolation is neither heroized nor made pathetic. The way her shadow dominates the picture and underscores literally the group makes her identity more subtly assertive. She is finally the only one who seems to possess an articulated personality in this painting. Now to contrast this with an example which I, I must describe to you because we don't have a, a reproduction of it, of the kinds, the depths of sentiment, sentimental, sentimentalism that the Machiaioli could sometimes give themselves over to. There was a painter named Zandomeneghi who began as a Machiaiolo, um, uh, left uh, and worked in Paris for many years, became a kind of oh, second drawer impressionist, um, who had a, did a painting in 1873 of, of beggars in front of a convent in Florence. And uh, um, in this painting, we see a sexton who's ladling out soup to all these poor people. Their mothers and children are scattered around the steps. And each figure in this painting by Gian Domenegui is meticulously posed. One is lifting a plate to her mouth, another spoon feeding a child, another scooping the last drops from a, a, a tilted cup of soup. The scene, in other words, is purposive with a vengeance. And it's sentimental because, and sentimental because it allows no uh, competing response to the response of sheer pity. It is sentimentality, in other words, um, which is a form of moral tyranny in art because it tells us how we are allowed to respond and does not permit us to respond in any other way. Um, the bad social condition in that Zandomeneghi painting is not discovered in the formal interrogations of the artist Rather, it's deposited there. It's sort of riveted uh, to the scene. And in that instance, the Machia does not draw or lead realism into what really should be, and in the hands of the better Machiaioli painters was, a kind of auroral wakefulness to the new facts, the new instances. Um, the third of these uh, painters that I'd like to talk about is uh, Giovanni Fattori. And uh, though many of the Machiaioli were given over to mm, mood paintings and a kind of uh, drippy um, melodrama of scene, scenic melodrama, uh, the one who steadfastly refused the seductions of all that was Giovanni Fattori. He was the most prolific of the Machiaioli as well. And uh, also the most outspoken in declaring himself a realist. He was, he was much overlooked in his own time. In 1903, after a career that covered an amazing variety of subjects, military episodes in which he himself participated during the, the wars of the Risorgimento, portraits, seascapes, landscapes, interiors, he described realism in these words. Realism is the accurate study of contemporary society with the intention to reveal the evils with which society is afflicted and to convey the, to posterity our customs and habits. His genius, though, was a compound of the fleet, light registering impulses of Machia technique and a, a socially responsive realism, a kind of archival realism. Inevitably, 
especially in the numerous large military paintings that he produced. His pictures so scrupulously preserved historical anecdote that they sometimes remained formally inert or mechanical. But in his best work, when that compound is realized, he created pictorial space not by copying and miniaturizing depth and volume, but by laying these across the picture plane in a way that folded contents in strange and startling ways. Space in some of Fattori's pictures is a critical bearer, becomes a critical bearer of feeling, distended or contracted in ways that bring it, I think, right to the threshold of modernist space, that theatrical setting for the self-aware manipulations of perception and sensation. His art, in the interest of realist scruples, contributed unmistakably to the dissolution of conventional realist volume at space. At the same time, it must be said, he did not go so far as the Impressionists and turn representation inside out. Fattori, in fact, seemed to become a rather sour old painter. And I suspect that his assertions late in life uh, that were so bitterly put because bitterly put against divisionist painting, against all the new kinds of painting, because he sensed that he was at the end of something. Um, in 1981, he was attacking the sterility of the new painting. In 1902, still living in genteel poverty, despite his great local fame, that is great provincial fame, Fattori was giving lessons in life drawing in Florence. And one of his students, one of his most gifted students, was uh, the young painter Modigliani who very soon thereafter left for Paris. Of all of his military paintings, the one we're going to look at now, uh, called uh, Lo Staffato, or Man Caught in a Stirrup, done in 18, between 1880 and 1882, is, I think, the most disturbing and also the most technically robust. The lifeless soldier is being dragged face down behind his spooked horse. Fattori buckles the depth of the scene so that the horse galloping up a road away from us seems pitched beyond and above the soldier. We see first the soldier, his spread arms pull our attention to the long clawed tracks his hands have carved in the dirt. Then we take in the horse, and the horse is painted as if it were a, a dark ganglion of force, pure force. Because of the severely contracted space, the horse seems to be plunging into the canvas as if, as if being sucked back into the vortex of the imaginary perspective point. The elements Fattori marshals to create this gruesome pictorial mm, torque, the runaway violence, the useless restraining gesture of the dead cavalrymen, are all displayed across the canvas with a poised and almost decorative kind of suspension. In other instances in his painting, the documentarian impulse gets so mixed up with his desire to push paint around on a surface that we can see the bounds of representation being uh, tested. In a late painting called uh, Peasant Houses, for instance, the tumble-down stone structures are built out of wobbly macchie of color. There's firewood heaped under a shed, and sketched into the lower right corner is a woman whose pinched shoulders memorialize a life of repetitive labor. In steering toward my own understanding and evaluation of Macchiaioli art generally, my guide star from another constellation has been the painter I've already mentioned in passing, and that's uh, Degas. Their differences notwithstanding, they and he felt compelled to get down the facts of their time and place, and they experimented with color volumes to represent material reality. Degas was the greatest of them because he brought to a higher and more daring resolution the possibilities of color. He investigated more completely the sensations stirred by concrete images, concrete facts, and was passionate enough to question and to dismantle his own resolutions. While the Macchiaioli were good draftsmen, often superb colorists, with only a few exceptions, they did not kick loose the scaffolding of conventionally affecting social representation. And none of them, not even Fattori, had the almost deranged willfulness of imagination that could result in things like Degas' late pastels, the charcoal bathers, his sketches of ballerinas, which are about the effort to coax form from oblivion, the subject of which is to, to show the form life of a blankness. 
In Degas' work, there is often a cruelty, I feel, or at least a chilled and calculated disinterest, inseparable from formal curiosity, from image-making desire. This quality, this cruelty, like the coldness and arrogant purpose which Clement Greenberg once attributed to Matisse, is, I feel, one determining characteristic of modernist representation. Um, and uh, others had it. Matisse, I think Balthus had it. I think Morandi uh, possessed the same power, uh, the same coldness, if you will. As realists, the Machiaioli did not so much consume their subjects, however. They didn't have that kind of devouring appetite that they God did. They didn't consume their subjects so much as they shepherded and preserved them. And as a consequence, if you walk through the pity, uh, the pity galleries, you will soon tire of the, uh, the peasant women um, uh, that are represented in very local colorist terms. Their formal response to their materials was not, as a rule, contentious and disputative. It was grounded in receptivity, in accommodation, and in protectiveness. If we can speak of Degas' love for his subjects, it was a kind of love that challenged him to transfigure them, to give them over entirely into the exile of image life. I read an article by John Berger just the other day in which he said we should have a verb in the language. Uh, the verb should be Degas, so that one could speak of having been Degas in this way. This, extreme, this extremity of love being Degas in this way, which I think is hardly distinguishable from rage, the Machiaioli did not possess with that kind of intensity. The limitations, but also the importance of Machiaorealism set against the achievements of Degas, or for that matter, Cezanne, are, are apparent in some of Fattori's portraits. His portrait of my stepdaughter, which we have. This was painted in 1889, the same year that Degas did the pastel nude woman combing her hair, which I saw this morning, and uh, that Cezanne painted the Museum of Modern Art's boy in a red waistcoat. This painting shows a deft handling of color. The tonal range is rather austere. Black hair, eyes, earrings, the velvet choker, bracelet, and rings all draw our attention top to bottom, interrupting the fluid ivory folds of the woman's dress and flesh. A small red globe on a Japanese fan in her hand is the one titillation amidst all that pristine candor. In her expression, Fatori preserves a blend of youthful dreaminess, I think, and a patient regard for the act of portraiture. She is coyly aware of her role and evidently uninterested in it. Fatori seems intent on characterizing, most of all, the familial relation and the professional relation. And yet a few, day, a few years later, Cezanne would be telling his visitors that in portraiture, the hardest but most important thing to paint was the distance between himself and his sitter. That tells us one significant difference between late Italian realism of this kind and modernist representation. Fattori gives all those quivering fields and fabric and skin a startling presence so that we feel not only the little drama of circumstance, but also some of the force of incarnation he does not challenge the imaging of incarnation as Degas and Cezanne were already doing. That same year, uh, Fattori painted a charming portrait of his wife in which the suggestion of uh, incredulity, beguiled incredulity about the act of portraiture is rather wickedly expressed in a, a kind of toothy half grin that the woman has on her face. In, Fattori releases into that picture a quality of relation which preceded the picture event, and will presumably continue beyond it. The determinant uh, forces in that picture, and also in the picture, this picture of his stepdaughter, are essentially anecdotal affections. They are not the compulsions of research. For all their fine execution, and indeed insinuating feelings, they do not bear much trace of the transfigurative enthusiasm that was already becoming an actual part of uh, our imagination. There was an enormous quantity of Machiaioli painting produced from 1855 to 1900. 
as I mentioned in passing, if you look at enough of it, you begin to feel a conventionalized diffidence in a lot of it. At its most banal, it has a self-satisfied suggestiveness and a kind of atrophied curiosity, which are the signs of provincial art. After viewing several rooms in the Pitti stuffed with similarly achieved effects, all those scenes of peasant life, especially the softened renderings of the women, these are particularly cloying. Many of us will have seen enough. Signorini, Lega, and Fattori are important, first of all, because they painted more than a few exceptional pictures, but they also, more than the other Macchiaioli, did urge realist painting beyond the provincial circumspections of the Macchia. And incidentally, their work helps us, I think, to see more clearly the career of modern Italian painting. Not only the speedy self-exaltations of futurism, which turned violently against the cultivated modesties and nice Italy, cute Italy, that we find in so much Macchiaioli painting, but also the monastic rigor and obsessive studio-bound modesties of a Giorgio Morandi. I'd be glad to take questions. <laughs>